Our scripture reading this morning comes from James chapter 3. James chapter 3. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great and are driven by fierce of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your heart, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. May God bless the reading of his holy word for us, especially those verses that deal and treat with the subject of the tongue, are the basis for the instruction that God gives us in Lord's Day 43, Concerning the ninth commandment. One question. What is required in the ninth commandment? Answer. That I bear false witness against no man. Nor falsify any man's words. That I be no backbiter nor slanderer that I do not judge nor join in condemning any man rashly or unheard, but that I avoid all sorts of lies and deceit as the proper works of the devil, unless I would break down upon me the heavy wrath of God. Likewise, that in judgment and all other dealings, I love the truth, speak it, uprightly and confess it also that i defend and promote as much as i am able the honor and good character of my neighbor
we have seen that every one of the commandments arises out of the being of God. It's, there's something in God himself, who he is, what he is, that then is expressed in these commandments. So the commandments arise out of who God is. The commandment concerning our speech with regard to our God and our neighbor arises out of the truth about God, that God is a perfect speaker, a perfect communicator. Not only is what he, does what he say is perfect, but he knows that those to whom he is communicating, he is able to communicate accurately and perfectly to them. He takes responsibility not only for what he says, but he also takes responsibility to make sure that those to whom he's communicating understand him. God is a perfect communicator, perfect speaker. Secondly, God is truth. That's also implied in this commandment. God is truth. That fact means that he is reliable, that he is trustworthy, that what he says is true today is going to be true tomorrow and forever. So we can trust that whatever he communicates is accurate forever. And when Jesus prays, and that's interesting, it's inside of a prayer that he says, Thy word is truth. That he communicates his experience and what ought to be ours in relationship to the, to the God whose word is so reliable and always trustworthy. So, on the basis of that, we want to consider this commandment. The first, we want to consider just more of this general concept and our understanding of what this means. Secondly, we want to consider the violations that can so easily be done by us violating this commandment. And then thirdly and finally, we want to consider how is it that we are to keep this commandment as an expression of our gratitude to God for forgiving all of our lives. So first, more of the concept. God communicates perfectly inside the Trinity, inside his own being. The reflection of that for us is that we communicate accurately and honestly with our own thoughts. But God does that inside the Trinity. One of the worst things for us is that we deceive ourselves. It's not when others deceive us. We can really get upset with that. But it's far worse when we deceive ourselves. But that's often something we overlook or are even unaware of. That's how deceptive we are to ourselves. But God communicates perfectly God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father. So that Jesus said, Thy word is truth. Jesus himself, God the Son, is also truth. He brings truth. So that he can say in that familiar verse in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And I am the way because I am the truth. And I am the way and the truth because I am life. But I am the way because I am truth. I am the way for you and I show you the way. I am the way for you because I am truth. But then in the first chapter of John's narrative of the gospel, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. And literally the word declared is He leads us into a right understanding. So that verse 17, the verse before, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, even though there's more there than what we can have time to explain, just grasp this last part. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And that's because I am the way, I am the truth. God the Father, thy word is truth. God the Son, but also God the Holy Spirit is reflected in the Spirit of Jesus Christ that's given to us. So that in John 16, these familiar words are given to us. When He, the Spirit of truth, that's His identification, the Spirit of Christ, but here He's identified as the Spirit of truth shall come, He will guide you into all truth. Not some truth, all truth. He will guide you into all truth. God is truth. God communicates in such a trustworthy and perfect way that we can rely on Him for understanding all truth. One other thing, because truth comes out of God, and God is truth, God is more than just truth. And with that, there's a special application. Now there's more that we could say, but just look at these two attributes of God. God is truth, and God is love. There is a moral, ethical nature to truth. There's a moral, ethical nature. It's not, well, it's honest. I said the truth. I was accurate. That will never fly in the face of God. Because of this connection between truth and love. Jesus summarized all ten, and he included this one in that summary when he said, Love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that doesn't just cover the first four commandments. That covers all of the ten and all other laws. God is to be loved. And the second, which is like to the first, and now if we want to apply it specifically, includes this ninth in the second table. Love thy neighbor. Speak the truth. No false witness. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Why why didn't he stop right there? Wouldn't that have completed the ninth commandment? Don't bear false witness. Don't let your witness be inaccurate. May it always be perfectly honest and truth. Why does he add the last three words? And isn't it because we want to take to ourselves some accurate knowledge about someone and tell others, oh, it's accurate. 
It's not false. But God says, if you love me with everything that you have, and you do it because you realize how much I have loved and forgiven you of all your lies and all your deceit, then included in this commandment is anything that you say against thy neighbor. There's the concept as it begins in God. The application to us is rather simple and clear because God created us in his image. And when God created man in his image, then he gave to us the ability to know what's truth over against what's the lie. He did that when he set before them all of those trees and he set apart that one. Here's truth. You may eat of all of them. Love me. Here's the lie. When you choose, though there's nothing wrong with the fruit of that tree, to disobey me and eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you are taking upon yourself the right to determine what's true and what's false. Creating us in his own image, God calls us not only to be able to know accurately truth, as we were created in Adam, but also to be able to communicate that truth, to communicate with each other. And now communication is far more than speech. Yes, the tongue is the great, great instrument, the chief instrument for communicating. But it's very interesting that when Adam and Eve fell into sin, they communicated. Ha <laughs> ha, did they ever communicate? But they it's never recorded that they said a word. They looked into the eyes of the other and they covered themselves up. There was communication. And we realize that the gift of communication is not just speech, but we call it body language. All kinds of other ways in which communication is being done. God gifted us. He didn't gift a tree with that. But he gifted us with that. With the ability to be able to do that. So first, with regard to God, we become, as his creator, creature rather, his highest creature, the mouthpiece for all of creation. The Psalms. Think of the first part of Psalm 8. And... Psalm 19, we can see a sunrise or watch a sunset. And we've had some of them this past week. Just gorgeous. They don't speak. You can't hear them. But we become the mouthpiece to express what they are declaring about their Creator. You watch the birds gather the straws pieces of grass as they are making their nests. You see them active already. They're, they don't say a word. Or when they do sing, we can't understand what they're saying, but we can give expression with them to our Creator and Master. And God sets before us not only Him, but also our neighbor. And there's where God says, no, you can't see me, but I have put myself in the person of every neighbor that I give to you. And they are the way in which you are challenged to, to speak the truth about me by how you speak and communicate to them. Seek their well-being. Seek their good. Love them. Just as you love me. Regardless of what they've done to you, 
regardless of the way in which they act, regardless of what they've just said, I set them, God tells us, as your neighbor, my the neighbor I want you to have as a test, as a learning experience, as the way in which you can grow in knowledge about how to respond and praise me and to love them. But again, here's the challenge. We just let ourselves right to it, and that is that truth and love go together. There's all kinds of ways to say it. Let's look at some. If there is no love, there is no truth. If there is no deliberate, conscious love, there is no truth, no real truth. Speak the truth in love. Where there's love, there is truth. Now turn them around. If where there's truth, if you really grasp truth, there's love. Where there's no truth, there's no real love. Dwell on that. Think on that. See the connection. There's all kinds of ramifications. But put those two together. Truth, accuracy, that's morally ethic, along with love. Truth and love together. Adam fell into sin, and when Adam fell into sin, he created and caused us to become liars, natural liars. We are liars not only because we lie, but we are liars especially because we the distortions that sin causes in our thinking makes it such that natural man is incapable of knowing truth and incapable of loving truth. Incapable of knowing it and incapable of loving it. So you have those psalms that begin, Psalm 14, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. God's description of the sinfulness of man at the time of the flood, Genesis 6, verse 5. Every imagination. Now, God gifted us with thinking. God gifted us with imagination. Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually. So that, Romans 8, verse 7, the natural man is enmity against God, hates God. So absolute possibility and that a natural man is always going to say there is no God. Or if he says there is a God, there is a God, he has no accurate representation and understanding of that God. He has no standard. He has no thought that that God will judge him one day. When he gets that idea, he does everything he can to drown it. So that the canons of Dort in the third and fourth head, in the middle of Article 15, say this, that man denies that there's a hell, or he vainly boasts the possession of that which we have, of that which he does not have. He thinks he's going to have it. He says he's saved. But he vainly boasts the possession of that which he does not have. Natural man, with regard to God, speaks of God this way. Romans chapter 1. He takes the truth. 
and he holds it down. He holds it under in unrighteousness. So that this is the description of man. Romans chapter 3. Natural man has no understanding. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. Then this. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. But that's not just true of the reprobate. The regenerate too. This past Wednesday night in the Bible study, we considered that last part of James 1. The child of God can be a hearer of the word or a doer. But the distinction is not that one just sits here and hears and then doesn't do anything later on. That, that's the commonly understood meaning. That's not what James is writing about. But he says this, the hearer of the word, somebody who is a hearer only, is he gets out of the Bible an understanding of his natural face, of his human nature. The Bible will tell him about his human nature. But what does he do with that knowledge? He straightway forgets. He immediately doesn't want to remember what kind of a man he is. But the doer of the word, oh, by the way, I forgot something. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I see what I am, and I don't remember what I am as I go on through life, especially when I'm in a debate, especially when I'm in an argument. I am not going to remember my natural face. I deceive myself. A doer of the word is somebody who knows his nature, aware of his easily deceiving himself. He knows that. He sees that. And he continues in therein. He can, keeps that knowledge always before him. So he's always aware of his nature to lie, to deceive, to exaggerate, to minimize, and not be accurate even to the hurt of his own cause. The child of God, whose eyes are open to truth and open to himself, learns then to conduct himself in such a way that he is very, very careful. He doesn't want to present a case inaccurately. That's where gossip and slander come in. Gossip is the presentation of accurate fact. Slander is adding some exaggeration or distortion to it so that it becomes false. And remember... You put one drop of falseness into truth and it's slander. One little addition, one little exaggeration, one little minimization, and the truth is no longer truth. Gossip is speaking the truth unnecessarily. Gossip is passing along sensitive information to those who have no need to know it, who will not be benefited by it. Gossip is malicious. What does God have to say about violations of this commandment.
Proverbs 12, verse 22. Lying lips are abomination to Jehovah. They that deal truly are his delight. Lying lips are abomination to Jehovah. Proverbs 19, verse 5. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh lies shall not escape. Verse 9. A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh lies shall perish. Well, isn't he saying the same thing? Why be so repetitive? Because when somebody says a lie about us, we know what we want to do. We immediately and quickly can take vengeance for ourselves instead of leaving it to the Lord. And God says this twice in short order and many other places as well because he wants us to know, I heard them. They may have said it in secret, but I heard them. They may have done it in a text. I saw it. And they shall not be unpunished. But now, hear it again. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh a lie shall not escape. And all of a sudden, if we're going to be a doer of the word, now I get scared for myself. How many times is my presentation of something not with total accuracy? How many times do I tell a story and add a little, take away a little? There are six, no, seven things that God hates. Proverbs 6 says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to Him. One, a proud look. Two, a lying tongue. Two, on God's list of hate is a lying tongue. Nothing makes us look like, look like the devil more than distortions of the truth because he is a liar from the beginning. John 8, verse 44. And he's always lying to us. Always. He is the one who wants to convince us that we're too sinful to be saved. He is the one who leads us in self-deception. He wants to separate us from the knowledge of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And he works hard, that liar, to distort the truth of what God does in Christ for us. He never tells the truth, even though his words can be accurate. That's why, they can be biblical, I mean. That's why false prophets and false teachers are so devilish. They use the words of Scripture, but they fill them with different meaning than what Scripture gives to them. Revelation 21 Verse 8 tells us 
who will be cast into the lake of fire. We're quick to understand. Unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters. We say amen, amen, amen. And then he adds, and all liars. But beloved, there's more. And the more is this. That God, who is so truthful and so reliable and so trustworthy, who communicates perfectly, also communicates to us this. He is a God who forgives, and He's a God of grace. And nothing can separate us from that love that He has for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not the standard of whether we're true enough or truthful enough to have earned His love. Let us come to this point in the sermon and say, I have not earned, I cannot earn His love. But now God comes to us and He says, I don't love you because you're good enough. I have never have and I never will. I love you because I want to. I love you and show that love in my Son. What God does then is He implants within us a restoration of the ability to know Him accurately. If the lie, deny Him. The truth is, we get to know God in Jesus Christ who communicates. He knows the Father, the only begotten of the Son, John 1, 17 and 18. And He has revealed Him to us, grace and truth. He reveals grace and truth. God doesn't love us because we deserve it. It's love undeserved, grace and truth, so that we grasp accurate understanding. Well, it is accurate, but it's not everything, because the volume of the truth about God's being is so infinite. We, Herman Hooksema is to have said, he scratched the surface of the body of truth. We just get a beginning. Now, it's accurate. What we see is true, but we always realize there's so much more to know about Him. It'll take forever in eternity. His Spirit imbibes in us, the Spirit of truth. That's the Spirit every single child of God has, whether He's aware of the presence in the womb or not. We have that Spirit of truth. And that spirit of truth enables us not only to know it, but to love it. To love the truth. Even, and maybe especially when it hurts. Because our love for Him and our neighbor makes us, by that spirit, truth tellers and truth lovers. The Apostle Paul presented the truth of particular sovereign grace in the first three chapters of Ephesians. And then he wanted to apply it to these new, relatively new Christians in Ephesus. And the first thing that he says in his application, if you really understand this truth, then he says, I beseech you, Walk worthy of that calling with which I've called you. And then he uses 15 more verses to apply it to the unity of the body. And a part of that unity of the body is this in verse 15. Speak the truth in love. And when he's finished with that application... He goes on to other applications. Here's a good one. He says, you're different. You're a different kind of Gentile now. This is human nature. Listen to the description. I should have read this earlier. Ephesians 4, verse 18. They walk in the emptiness of their mind, in vanity of mind, 
Their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now, you're not that anymore, he says to those Gentiles that are now converted in the church. You've been taught and heard Jesus Christ. So, he says in verse 25, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. We are members one of another. First application after put off the old, put on the new. Put away lying. Then he talks about anger. Then he talks about stealing. And then he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but rather that which is good to the use of edifying, building up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Brothers and sisters, I had all kinds of brothers. We knew how to talk. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. Speak that which is good to the use of the building up of that sister and brother, that it may minister, serve grace unto the hearer. God calls us then to do that this way. If we have the truth within us, we are going to confess all the distortions of the truth that we speak. But that's going to start by our eyes being open to the fact that we can so easily deceive ourselves and forget our nature, our deceptive nature. We don't have to worry about other people deceiving us. We, well, we should, yes. But we should have a much more concern that we deceive ourselves. Do you know who you really are? Do you know how you really come across? You think you do. But God keeps communicating to us truth. And the body, at the heart of that truth is, I'm a God of grace. I've forgiven you. I'm forgiving you. I'll never stop forgiving you. Never. As soon as you remember some distortions of the truth that you may have communicated, tell me, and then listen to me. Really listen, and I'm going to tell you, it's gone paid for. It's forgiven. And he does that to us repeatedly. He never is ashamed to tell us how many times, over and over, I've forgiven you. And he does that so that we, in gratitude, that powerful, most powerful of all attitudes, our gratitude will move us to remember our nature. To love and enjoy the truth. To give witness of the truth concerning God and His grace and His justice. We'll then use our tongues to speak of His praise. We'll love to sing. And even if we can't carry a note, we'll praise Him. Because we love Him in thanks. We will strive more and more to be a mouthpiece for all of the praise that mute creation gives. We will work to express creation's homage to their Maker. We will work to think and speak the truth about our neighbor or to our neighbor seeking only the spiritual good of those we speak about and those that we speak to. We will use our tongues in service to God for His glory. Not how can I win an argument, but how can God be glorified? 
But this commandment also touches listening. There's a rather neat proverb, 26 verse 20. Where no wood is, the fire goes out. Tongue may be the cause of a great fire. But if I don't listen, where there's no wood, nobody eager to hear what they have to say, where there's no wood, there the fire goes out. Honor him with your tongue. Honor him with your ears. Thank him. Amen. Gracious God, take thy word, the truth of the scriptures, the pure doctrines of the gospel, and apply them to us so that we grasp what they mean, love them, and are committed to live, living according to them. Be thou our teacher. And guide us so that our life will reflect our gratitude. For Jesus' sake, amen.